Welcome everyone to Voices with Verveke. I'm joined again uh, by, uh, with Gary Shang, who, as you remember, is uh, the creator and leader of Civics Unplugged, a project uh, uh, to sort of reformulate the culture and reconstitute democracy. And he's brought uh, two ladies here from his community of practice. And I'm gonna turn things over to Gary now to introduce himself again and yeah. introduce them. So Gary, take it away, please. Yeah, thanks so much, John. It's so good for all of us to be here. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of, of Civics Unplugged. Um, just to kind of briefly recap, I was at Google for uh, several years. Um, around midway, I realized that uh, there was a lot of uh, mutually exacerbating crises, mm -hmm. uh, one of which, thanks to John, um, I realized that the meaning crisis was at possibly the nexus of, 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 of all of this. Mm -hmm. um, including an education crisis and a crisis of democracy, a crisis of uh, legitimacy of just about every institution. Um, so I left Google last uh, about a year and a half ago. It's been the most meaningful thing that by far that I've ever done. And uh, we, we, we train, we develop young leaders uh, and uh, our pride and joy is our community of practice of what we call future builders. And so today we have um, people that inspire me every day, uh, Madison and Chabu. Um, you know, I'll, I'll let you uh, introduce yourselves. Though. Yeah, uh, I can go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Madison Adams and I'm a 17 year old high school senior from Verdigris, Oklahoma. And I got involved in the fellowship um, in February and then like just had an amazing experience within the fellowship and from there went on to help build CU summer camp with two of the other fellows um, in response to the mass cancellations due to COVID-19 and from there went on to just do a number of things in preparation for next year's fellowship and now I get to help with a lot of dialogue series at CU. And my name is Chabu Kapumba. I am 18 years old. I currently um, live in Toronto, but I'm from the suburbs of Chicago as well. And um, I'm also a first year at the University of Toronto. I came to see you hoping to explore something that I already knew that I was passionate about, which is like long-term democracy reform and serious systems interventions. Um, not only to, I didn't anticipate that it would also be almost like a systems intervention of my own. And I got to learn so much about myself and reframe my idea of the future. And right now at CU, I currently work to help support um, empower builders as a empowerment associate, and then also work on new and upcoming exciting ideas. Well, well there's two things right away that I'd like to talk to both of you about. I don't, well, uh, one, Madison, uh, and you guys can take it however, which, whatever order you want. Madison, I'm really interested in this. Your director of dialogue practice. I'd like to know. Uh, you can, uh, for obvious reasons, that deeply intrigues me, and I'd like to know more about that. And then Chabu, I was really interested in what you said about the interconnection, about you know learning about systems intervention, but this kind of deep self knowledge. It's you know almost Socratic in nature, and I'd like to find more about how that unfolded for you. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question, John. Um, so the the position of like the director of dialogue just kind of happened organically so from the beginning of the fellowship we had this series called unplugged conversations where we would take what we call like civic superheroes so people from the world of like not just civics and politics but um people who can like kind of plug in and like help you know reform democracy in some way and have helped um and so we had like a dialogue series with them throughout the fellowship where we would invite them and it was like a pretty traditional like interview so we would like ask them you know yeah. pre-formulated questions and they would answer and then all of our community members could come and watch the conversation but i think it was about in june when we made the decision to completely like revolutionize the whole series um because we felt like we could be doing so much more with it right if we're gonna have all these you know, amazing community members who can contribute to so much to the conversation and these civic superheroes who are already doing so much, like, can we find like a better way to like connect them and have more meaningful dialogue? And mm -hmm. so we kind of like flipped the idea of a traditional interview like on its head. So what we did is now we don't ask the, 
the, the, the guest questions, they ask us questions. Oh, cool. So they come, yeah. So they come with like, they have like their, their area of like expertise or whatever. They have like a topic and then they pose five questions to the community and throughout the conversation, you know, everyone's getting to answer and they're getting to ask follow up questions and like, you know, go down like meaningful threads of dialogue. Um, and it's just like a super intimate experience where everyone like everyone leaves with something meaningful. Um, and then we also, yeah, and so now we, Gary started um, another series we do called Groupthink on our YouTube channel. And what happens there is we have a group of builders and then we, the only thing we do to prepare for that was just, we just like pick a topic. So whether that be like technology or education, and we just talk about whatever feels meaningful based on burning questions. Mm -hmm. So like someone will pose a question um, and then, you know, everyone just gets, gets to answer. And then when it feels you know, appropriates, they pose another question and we just keep oh, going. And right. so, cool. yeah, and it's just been, it's been so amazing to learn about um, just like what it means to have meaningful dialogue. Um, because I think like in the like education system, like we're not really taught, it's not just the education system, right? Like it's like as a society, like I feel like we don't know how to, to talk, to have like meaningful conversations. And so just to have that whole idea of conversation and dialogue like revolutionized for me. And like, I know I've learned and grow, like grew so much um, and I'm just excited to learn so much more as well. What are some of the major insights you've got about, I mean, you're very passionate and I agree wholeheartedly with, you know, uh, the society in general does not know how to dialogue anymore. I've been doing a lot of work on that myself. So uh, what are some of the key insights you think you've got from this about uh, what's been missing and what are some of the central features that constitute a really good dialogue? Yeah, I would say something that's not just like at the core of dialogue, but like the core of everything that we're doing at CU is like empathy. And, um, and I think what comes with that is like the phrase like listening lovingly. So mm. I know like a lot of times like conversations, especially conversations about politics end up being about like, um, like getting your point in. And it's like, it seems to me that like talking points are like the enemy of meaningful dialogue. And it, that's been something that's been really hard for me to grasp because I've been doing debate all my life. All right. And so it's like, oh, you're like, you're rewarded if you use talking points, you're rewarded if you come with all this pre-prepared information. It's like, you sound smart. You sound like we have this joke, like you say something profound is our joke because it's always like, say something that sounds good, you know? Um, yeah. So it's like, you know, being rewarded all my life to say things that sound good. Um, th and then like just trying to transition to like actually going into the conversation with the mindset that I want to learn something right, has right. completely like, it's just changed the whole way I view dialogue. And it's, it's been really hard to unlearn. Like it, it's, it's so hard to not, you know, formulate what you're going to say before you say it and to actually go in like with the mindset that, you know, I, I want to learn something from the people around me within this conversation. Does it happen that you spark off of each other and you feel like that you're all getting to places you couldn't get to on your own kind of thing? Yes, it's, um, and that's what's so great about groupthink is, you know, you just, you get to let the conversation flow wherever it feels meaningful. You know, like someone can mention something and they can build off the top of that. And then they can just ask another question and it just like goes into all these really interesting threads. Um, and so it's like, it's like nothing's forced. Everything that you're talking about feels meaningful, which mm. is really cool to see. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah I, I'm doing a lot of work with my good friend and co-author Christopher Mastapietro and also work with Guy Senstock trying to figure these kinds of processes out. And like, I agree with you. I think we've largely forgotten them and forgotten what they feel like and forgotten how meaningful they are and how generative they are. Um, so I want to talk to you more about this, but I also want to, uh, I want to hear what uh, Chibu has to say about that kind of self-knowledge she was talking about. Um, no, I think that what Madison spoke of is in direct um, correlation with kind of like mm -hmm. the systems intervention I had personally in the sense that so much of the f initial fellowship was not only just like learning about the democratic process and what it looks like and what it could look like, but then we were also tasked with like completing our leadership blueprint, which is really almost like mapping out yourself. And so it was almost like establishing a meaningful internal dialogue. Oh, um, yes. oh wow. That's really intriguing so to me. Cool. Yeah, that's yeah. So intriguing to me. And I was 
constantly shocked by the fact that like someone it was almost it was as simple as being asked what are your core values and right. of course you know your core values but being forced to articulate it mm. um made it resonate all that much more and that much easier to seek those things out um in right. the world right. around me and i think that having um undergone the fellowship and then completing my leadership blueprint and then you know, going into like other C like tasks and activities, I don't think that I would um, be ready to engage in so many great, cool conversations um, with like Gary and Madison and Groupthink if I hadn't had to at first, you know, have that really meaningful dialogue with myself because I'm almost surprised by the things that I'm like I can easily talk about even though I've never really had those conversations beforehand. Um, so it's def it was it's very interesting to see how like your personal um, system impacts like the way that you engage with the world in attempts to have system change take place too. So it sounds like it goes both ways, right? You you do this internal dialogue and then that empowers the external dialogues and then you take it back into your internal dialogue. Is it, Am I understanding you correctly? Absolutely. And the fact that it's always ongoing, right, I feel like right. I've had like 10 evolutions <laughs> within the past six months. And it's just so cool to see because it's not just something that I'm going through. Like I've seen it in the other builders who are also like now my personal friends um, and just how enriching the experience has been as well. That's interesting. So like you see yourself growing in self-knowledge and you see other people growing in self-knowledge and those are like they get paired together or joined together in some fashion. And that, that sponsors kind of a, a deep friendship. Is that, is, that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Especially because you understand that you have like this shared commonality of right, really valuing right. yeah. what's happening to our collective being in the next few years, in the next few decades. And so it makes it really easy to be open about like these like pressy concerns that you can't necessarily talk to all your friends about. Right. And so that's like a bonding experience in itself. So you feel like you have a place, therefore, where you can explore things really deeply then? Oh, absolutely. I think the initial shock of CU was just like, oh, wow, there's other people my age who care this much about the things that bother me all the time. And mm -hmm. that message has just like been driven further and further the more time I spend here. So, so do you feel like you've become more clear about that caring? Uh, this part really, really interests me. Like when people get a sense that, you know, that they're, they're caring better than they used to, not just more intensely, but like with more understanding, more appreciation. Is that, is that happening? For sure. I think that it, you can really see it, like how, how we care has changed mm. in the sense that our approach isn't in the sense of like what product can we produce, more of how can we create something really meaningful, really insightful? Um, how do we like not rush the process? How can we promise to like reiterate and grow in like what we're doing here? That's really cool. I, wow, I'm glad that Gary brought you to like, you guys are talking about stuff that I'm just so deeply, well, that I care deeply about and um, I, I'm really appreciating it. So you both have said, and uh, you know, whoever wants to speak next, please. You both have said that, you know, you've invoked that things are, be, are more meaningful to you. Do you feel that your lives in general are now more meaningful? I can just go ahead and answer to that. Um, I would say like, that would be like an understatement. I just, I think like what, not only like your work has done, but like also like what Gary has taught me, what CU has taught yeah. me. It's like, it's helped me. It's like really made me like experience like, like a, a whole different like human experience because like before exploring your work and like and see you and everything that I've learned I just thought that like the way that you cultivate knowledge and wisdom is through like through education through like exploring different subjects like math and, and science and history and just like studying things more um so what what this has all done for me it's like opened like a new world of curiosity um mm -hmm. of just so many more things becoming meaningful and and um like i mean something that you mentioned you like you referenced socrates in like the beginning of the meaning crisis when you're talking about he says like i know what i do not know or like um and, and that's kind of like what i feel like is that i don't feel like i'm more knowledgeable because like of all these like lessons that i've learned whatever it's because it's like I've learned so much more about like what there is to explore and what there is to learn and, and all these new 
um, relevant things. Um, and so it's just, it's been, it, it's so hard to explain exactly what it is because like any, like saying say any direct thing would be like almost narrowing down my experience because it's just like completely right, right. revolutionized the way I see myself in the world. What about for you, Chavo? Do, like, is your life in, in general more meaningful? Do you find that to be the case? Yeah, I think that, um, <clears throat> I think that it's also like given me the, cause I'm in a constant state of reassessing yeah. and recalibrating what I like, what do I have a natural energy for? Um, and so by doing that, I get to validate the things that are really powerful to me to bring more of them into my life, to make them more of like the center of like, you know, what I want to put my time behind. And so it means that I have more meaningful days more often. And then I also think that because of the CU community, I have so many opportunities to have like meaningful moments outside of myself because there's, you know, a standing community of people who are more than happy to, you know, go go over a conversational deep end with me if that's what I need on a Friday morning right, and right. so I, um, it's been more meaningful in the sense that I, it forces me to spend more time with things that matter to me and then I also have more opportunities to have meaningful moments outside of myself which I love oh, that's amazing that's amazing so you got you you're you're both very different than you know, the, the sort of doomer uh, culture that's often portrayed as representing your generation. Um, like how, do you feel any significant contrast between, you know, who you are now and the community you're in and sort of your, <clears throat> you know, your, your regular day co cohort of people? Do you, do you feel like there's a contrast or, um, or, or, or does it feel like they're interested in what you're doing at all? Or like, how's it happening? in that comparison for you? Um, I think I can start off by saying that I think that there's more, we have more in common with like other Gen Zers who, not, who are not inside the CU community. Like there's very little differences between us. Uh -huh. The biggest distinction is having the opportunity to invest, grow that part of ourselves that is, you know, looking to do something. Right. Um, and to invest and grow in a way that's really meaningful and also by having like the guidance to do so because we have so much access to information I think like how to steps isn't the issue but just knowing what is the most relevant way to start um, in a way that's like impactful and meaningful so I think that it's just a matter of like who has had the opportunity to be um, around people who will cultivate that want rather than turning it into like almost like a thing of contradiction or an ongoing issue or, you know, something to be not like not upset about, but something that, you know, you see as like, oh, this is like our impending doom. But in reality, it's like, this is almost like our calling, what we are supposed to be focusing in on. That's interesting. Do you, do, do you find any of your non-community friends like attracted? Because, you know, you both are very enthusiastic about this, right? Do you find that they're attracted to you know, civics unplugged because of what they see? Yeah, I think that like, for me at least with my friends, cause I have friends who are like also in activist spaces who yeah. go to school with me and we're like interested in the same topics as me. And we'd, um, and I've kind of be like, but here's this place where it's more than okay to just care about it, but like super tangible tools to address it right. are present. And I get to, almost like employ those tools in our conversations. And like, well, if you're looking at this issue, can we take a step back and like assess our assumptions? Or um, how are we going to do this in a way that incorporates all these other like schools of thought or, you know, histories and pasts and sciences and all those things. So I think that it's cool in the sense that I don't have to be like, oh, CU is so great. I use CU tools all the time and it kind of translates in itself. That's really good to know. That's powerful. That's very powerful. I mean, I think the transfer of skills is much more important than just the presentation of ideas. So if people are seeing that and realizing it. That's very, that's very important. What, what about you, Madison? What, what's, how's your experience been? Yeah, I think I, I've, I've begun to do something similar to Chabu. Um, something that's been super um, just helpful for me has been like our, our small group, like our June toes, you know, that you and Gary talked about in your last conversation. Right. Um, and I have like, I've tried, I'm going to start implementing 
kind of that same format within uh, one of my classes at school. And I, I was like trying to start one in my family just because um, while CU is like, has this ultimate goal of like, you know, trying to empower, you know, like Gen Z to, to build American democracy, like so much of it is not even really like, it doesn't have to be directly related to like building democracy. It's a lot of like, um, like self discovery. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and that's just been really cool to be able to implement um, like into different areas of my life. And it, it, as far as like, um, and, and, and I feel like everyone like in our generation has the ability to be as supercharged and as passionate as we are about this because you know, what, what, what we're trying to build is really like, and you know, we say the future of American democracy, but it's really like the future of like our society. Yeah. And, and because of that, like everyone has a way to plug in and it, it, it should be relevant to everyone. And so like, like Chabu is saying, like the difference between us and like someone who's not in our community is really just the fact that th like they're not in our community. Like I wouldn't be where I am today without all the amazing people um, like within my Junto and like Gary and Chabu um, to be able to help me realize all these things and, and to become so passionate about it. And so it really just speaks to the power of community and our culture um, and, and just like how important all of that is. Wow, I really, uh, I'm, I'm impressed by um, the, opti the optimistic appraisal you have of your generation. You know, I mean, if I'm hearing both of you right, you basically say there's a tremendous potential there and all they need is the proper tools to actualize it. Is that, is that fair to say that? I would second it by saying the proper, the proper tools, but as well as like the right culture. Right, um, so right. Well said. Yeah, well said. Well said. So say a little bit more about that. What do you mean by the proper culture? That's a good point. I think that um, because like post fellowship, we kind of enter this like era where we were, you know, working on Commence 2030 and like new upcoming projects and then considering stuff about like the next fellowship. And so we, we were almost at a point where like we had the tools, but what solidified and fortified all of our learning was being around people who would like almost remind you that these are tools or assets that you have that you can use to address mm. challenges and issues. Mm. And so it's, it's like the knowledge, but then the, also the application portion to like make sure that, that you've really like learned and absorbed um, what you've taken in. Right, right. That's a very good point. I like that point about, the, about community and culture being necessary to properly home the tools. Uh, so, I mean, you guys have made reference a couple times to uh, my work um, and like, I, you know, obviously in one sense, I'm egocentrically and narcissistically interested in it. Uh, but uh, if you could uh, avoid that aspect of it, uh, I'm more interested in like, how, how is my work helping you? Maybe is the question I'd like answered. Uh, like, what are you, like, is it, is it helping you? Maybe I'm being presumptuous. Uh, but if it is, how it, is it? How does it plug in to what you're learning with Gary? Uh, you know. That's the general tenor of the question I'm trying to ask. Okay, I guess I can start. Um, I would definitely say that, and this was a phrase that was like introduced to me by Gary maybe like a few weeks ago, but I can see over time how I've been obsessed with like this idea of sense making mm -hmm. or understanding how like my life is the way it is as a byproduct of like hundreds of years of history and right. cultural practices and you know everything is almost like a byproduct of things that are beyond me and my understanding and i think that i was able to like explore that a little bit in high school um like when you talk about feminism as a woman i'm like oh like this explains x y and z in my day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. and so it was really great in the sense that learning has always been an asset in helping me understand um my identities and so looking into your series it almost like exponentially pushed the boundaries of like sense making in the sense that it was 
almost like a complete collaboration of all these different fields of interests and principles. Like there are no boundaries. Um, the way you reference philosophy and religion and almost like, like I feel like I had an understanding of them before, but like reframing them as assets and tools to helping you understand and make sense of the world that you know we live in. And so it's been so great in the sense that it's been a great way to get an understanding of I thought I was looking at the big picture, but now I feel like I'm really getting like a world oriole view of like the things that we're looking at from like a historical sense, a philosophical sense, from a religious perspective, from, you know, even a scientific perspective, from a political perspective. And so it's been, it's exposed me to so much language um, and understanding. And it's also something that I can't wait to continue to like dive into. Thank you for saying that. I, so that makes, I, I mean, that's that's extremely um, encouraging, even gratifying to me to know that uh, what I do is really helping other people on the Socratic project. Like that, that really matters to me. That's 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 uh, that's an ideal that I have, a pedagogical ideal. Um, so thank you for saying that. That was, uh, and I'm glad. I'm, I'm genuinely glad that my work has been helpful to you. No, it's been so meaningful. I couldn't say thank you enough. Well, you did. You did. You, you really <laughs> did. You really did. <laughs> um, I would just say for me, um, at, at CU, we've been calling it like unplugging, like realizing all these things, but it is in a lot of ways like awakening from the meaning crisis, you know, and what, what your series has helped me do is like help me awaken from the meaning crisis and be able to see um, like the ways and like like Chabu was saying like just be able to do more sense making of like myself and the world and it's it's helped me be able to see like um, well so it's like it's helped me understand um, like like why other like um, how to go about helping other people like either unplug or like awaken from the meaning crisis as well because you know what we're trying to do at CU is you know it's like a culture change mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so much of that is trying to get people to um, realize like a, a lot that you're talking about in your work um, and so just being able to make sense of it myself I feel like is is helping me able to help other people and get me um, really supercharged at the prospect of doing that as well. Well, thank you. That's fantastic. Um, I guess that's also very, very encouraging. So I have a bit more of a challenging question for you both then, now that we've sort of crossed. So what's the connection? And, and like, this is a free form question. So, you know, go as far as you want. What's the connection between awakening from the meaning crisis and restoring democracy? You know I was going to ask at least one Socratic question, right? Had to. Um, no, we had to anticipate it. I think <laughs> that I can start off by saying that um, in its like purest form, democracy is supposed to be a reflection of the people, right? Mm. And so the meaning crisis is something that's exponentially impacting every single individual mm. as, as well as us as a collective. And so if democracy is a reflection of the people and the people are having this meaning crisis, then our democracy will also have a meaning crisis. Oh, wow. In some way or another. Yeah. Um, and I love how um, easy it is to pick up the parallels between like your internal well-being um, and how your understanding of yourself and then also how that's reflective in just like how we are collectively um, as a group. So yeah, I'd say that the correlation is the fact that democracy is the people and the people are having this meeting crisis and that is the correlation. That was good. Thank you. That was good. What about you, Madison? What would you say? How would you answer the question I posed? I, Chabu answered that really well. Um, I, I just <laughs> kind of, to, to kind of build upon that, um, I, I think a lot of it is like, in terms of like awakening from the meaning crisis is, um, kind of like realizing that a lot of the things that we do are kind of mindless and, um, mm. and, and, and in terms of like trying to shift society and culture like you can't be mindless in that you have to mm. Um, mm. There's, a, there's a lot of things you need to recognize about yourself 
in the, in the world and the human condition in order to do that. Um, and so it's like, we can't really reform democracy if we don't awaken people from the meaning crisis. Um, if they're not able to realize a number of things about um, themselves and their relationships with other people and, and, and see the vision for what it means for them to have a meaningful life and for us to have a meaningful and purposeful democracy and ultimately like a meaningful and purposeful world as well. Those are both very good answers. Yeah. Carrie, I'm really impressed. Uh, I'm really impressed with both of you. Um, I, I mean, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to also offer the opportunity, Madison and Tabu, if you guys want to ask me any questions, like I'm here like right now, if, you, if, you, if there's anything you'd like to ask me, uh, any questions you might have that I could answer for you, I'd be happy to do so. Yeah, I, I have a question. So um, whether you want to call it like unplugging or awakening from the meaning crisis, um, something that I've realized through this whole like process for me is like, while like I am realizing everything that people are doing that are like kind of like self-sabotage to like their happiness and, and, and them finding meaning in their lives, I'm also simultaneously becoming so much more empathetic mm -hmm. and loving and appreciative of other people at the same time. So it almost seems like a contradiction to me that like I'm like able to do both those at the same time. So I was wondering like, ha did you have the same experience throughout your series? Like, were, did you like simultaneously like realize like all these flaws, but also become like wildly more empathetic for people? And yeah. if so, like, why, why do you think that that happened? Um, I think part of it um, is that there's, there's, a, there's a deep connection between trying to realize the degree to which you're self-deceptive self, self and the cultivate, like as you try to overcome that, that's a component of meaning. And as you're trying to enhance the kinds of connections that make life meaningful, um, that awareness uh, of how self-deceptive you can be and how out of touch you can be um, I, I mean, it can go one of two ways. I mean, it, it can go into a self-aggrandizing thing, but then you very quickly lose touch with your insight, right? You lose touch with being able to realize your self-deception and how you're out of touch. So the other, ways, the other way it can go, um, it, it, when the better angels of our nature speak, is it, it, it creates a kind of humility. Um, and, and, and that humility... The humility is important, uh, first of all, as like if you're trying to put yourself out there, because if you don't have humility, it can really inflate you very quickly. So just as um, a counterbalance is good, but the humility also, if it's genuine, and I, I hope it is for me, I aspire to it, then um, it makes you more empathetic. It makes you realize um, how that a lot, yes, people are out of touch. And there is, as you, as you said, Madison, there. There is mindlessness. There's self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. We have a, a lot of evidence of that, but at, uh, you can you can see that the difference between you and that person is really just a difference of degree, not a difference of kind. And you can also see, at times, you can feel the hunger and the hurt for meaning that's driving a lot of the behavior, and, and that's. Uh, very helpful. I, like I, I was motivated to do this series precisely because I, I could see a lot of people suffering, um, and, and then and the and the suffering isn't just inert suffering. Some people just get caught in the inertia, but it's a suffering in which they hurt not only themselves but other people. And so my motive was, was to try to reduce that. And you can't really reduce suffering if you frame it as like I'm going to inflict punishment or suffering or blame on these people because that's not really going to be effective. And so um, I think if you've got a good model, and Socrates was my model, of how, uh, well, like we've been talking about, how the cultivation of self-understanding is linked to understanding other people and, and vice versa, then you go down the humility pathway and that tends to make you more empathetic. Um, and I think a capacity for humility makes you, as you were saying, Madison, makes you really capable of listening to other people 
with, with the idea that I'm not going to speak, I'm not just going to speak to them, I'm going to try and learn from them. And I mean, it, remind, it reminds me of a, a, a Zen story about a, a guy who comes to a learn from the Zen master and they, well, he says, before I teach, I'm going to give you some tea. And he starts pouring the cup and he keeps pouring at the Zen master and it overflows the teacup and it's burning the guy's hand. He, stop, stop. And then it got, and the, the Zen master says, well, you're like, you're like the, this, you're overfilled. You gotta, you gotta be right. You're, you have to be ready. You have to be ready to listen. And I think humility is, if anything, it's a sensitivity to listening. So it makes you more aware this way and it makes you more open that way. And so those things, it, if they're if they're integrated with understanding, then empathy becomes a virtue, right? They right if they're if empathy empowers understanding and understanding empowers empathy, then you get a genuine virtue. You get like like you get like agape, or you at least get uh, genuine sympathy or compassion, things like that. So did that? Do you feel that answered your question? Yes, thank you for that. I I definitely resonate with that. Um, and just as a follow up. Um, maybe you, maybe this is not an answerable question, but um, what, what do you think differentiates between the, the, the person that goes down the path of humility and the person that does not? Um, what, what do you think is different in that experience? That's a, that, I mean, that's a, that's a tough question because that's, I mean, there's going to be all kinds of individual factors. I mean, there's going to be, um, you know, personality variables. Uh, I mean, I, I think the person's uh, you know, situation or their, their own idiosyncratic history um, is going to have an impact on that. Um, I think how they've, how they have been helped to cultivate their character is going to make an impact. Also the degree to which they have been exposed to like to, to, you know, to whatever degree trauma or, 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 you know, you know meaningless pain, uh, the, the world has a capacity and we found ways to really accelerate it of inflicting meaningless pain on people. And the thing about pain, and, and you can understand why it's adaptive pain, pain, both psychological and physical makes you very self-centered, right? And, it, and, and what you're trying to do is right. Turn everything inwards. And, and so if people have experienced a lot of meaningless pain, pain that they can't integrate into a narrative about how they're going to grow, uh, from the pain, um, then I think that can very much shift people um, in, in the wrong direction. Um, and, and and then you know not only pain, but it's 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 attendant shadow or or twin, which is desires. Often desires become uh, uncoupled and disproportionate because people are trying to address uh, pain that has not been properly processed. So there's issues of pain. There's issues of opportunity. Um, and people, of course, do not have a, often appropriate opportunity. Um, there's a degree to which there's personality variables. Somebody who's very low in openness is going to have difficulty um, with this. But, the, oh, but, you know, personality can always be compensated for by the cultivation of character. So how much have they have? Because everybody has to have a lot of help initially to cultivate their character. You guys are getting it right now, right? Before it becomes powerful enough, right? that right you can you can sort of take control of it for yourself you can appropriate it totally for yourself you, you like you like you said both of you you have to be given a lot of tools and a community that sustains you for quite a while before it becomes self-sustaining on and own if it ever does i think we always ultimately need to get more tools and more community so i'm sorry that's a very long answer but there's lots of interacting variables that i think toward go towards why some people um take this initial awareness of self-deception and being out of touch and turn it manipulatively towards, uh, you know, manipulating others, viciously towards manipulating others, I think is what I want to say, or virtuously towards humility and openness to sympathy and compassion. Mm, I, I really, I mean, I really appreciate that answer. And it's making me like realize even more the power of community because it's, it's like almost like community is the remedy to that pain that people are experiencing, you know? And I it's think like, so. Yeah, and it's like, even if they like need to process things, like, you know, it, without a community, you, they're left unprocessed, but with people, like, especially like, you know, in our Junto groups, like, 
and, and it's it, along like hand in hand with that is like the cultivation of character like we're yeah. we're growing and learning together so it's like it's almost like I wonder if like a big factor is whether they have the ability to process that with other people um and have like you know people to grow with and learn with and cultivate character with and just to help them uh you know process that that pain that you mentioned as well Chabu, do you have any questions you would like to ask me? I um, I think that like what resonated with your work for me so much was this idea of the lack of boundary mm. um, when it came to like ex exploring ex intersectionalities. Um, and there was this one video on symbols and metaphors. Oh, right. And, and just the idea of like by connecting these two things, you get to learn more than you would have originally understood had you mm. just looked at it through mm. one lens. And so I guess my question is, again, what comes with intersectionality is like losing the guidance of like boundaries and limitations. Right. Um, so as someone who's like trying to grow and learn in like really meaningful ways, especially like the information that I'm getting through classes and readings and so on and so forth, like how do you allow yourself to explore those intersectionalities without like, you know, explicit guidance as to, you know, you can't connect these two subjects or you should try and connect these two subjects. Yeah, that's a hard question. That's a very hard question. Not, not, but it's a very good question. Um, I don't know if I have that good of an answer. I mean, I tried to give an answer and I tried to exemplify an answer in the course, which, whereas I, the, the whole argument about um, what it is to pursue, pursue you know, and not just being, you know, a, a didactic and eclectic, right? And just sampling this and sampling that, but I gave the argument for synoptic integration and what that looks like and how you're trying to balance off uh, the differences but the shared identities and you're trying to construct that in a plausible manner um, so for me that's that's been the guide about how to do that uh, now i know it's it's not exactly the same and, and i hope you don't feel i'm being pretentious but you know trying to get even these different different these different disciplines with their different ontologies and methodologies and languages to talk to each other in a way like well, you know, simultaneously respecting the important differences, but discovering uh, the important connections. And as you said, not just doing that higgledy-piggledy, but trying to do it in such a way, well, as I tried to argue, that you're getting convergence and then you're getting elegance and they're balanced together. That, 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 that was a methodology that I, was, I, 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 I taught about in the series and then I tried to exemplify it throughout about how you go about these kinds of processes. Now. I'm not saying it's easy, but the thing is, if you, if you do synoptic integration in which you're simultaneously doing the integration and the differentiation, then you have the potential for the whole thing to complexify. And the thing about complexification is it produces new emergent functions. You get new emergent functions that then can feed back. And as you get that sense of emergent functions that are feeding back and helping you do it, I think that starts to become like very much a path that's guiding you. You can get a sense of, oh, going this way, I'm getting these new emergent abilities and they're helping me with the synoptic integration. And then the synoptic integration is complexifying and producing the emergent. Does that make sense to you? That, that's that been sort of how I work. You no, know, that does make sense. I've always like described it as like finding new nuances that make sense on both spectrums. Right. And no, it's definitely something that's like been, that you've like done a really good job of exemplifying. And, um, and I think also just like, as you, as I get to learn more, um, I almost want to like train my mind to be like, what is, how does this engage with something that's almost completely and totally irrelevant? Um, because I've found that that's an, a really easy way to find deeper meaning in both those things. I mean, I think that's, that's right. Um, and I think you've also put your finger on like maybe the, the deepest of at least the scientific themes running through the course, which is, you know, this, this problem of relevance realization, what really what's relevant and how do we improve that? Uh, and, and, you know, and it's largely not a matter about acquiring new beliefs, right? You, you have to acquire new skills. You have to acquire new perspectives. You have to acquire new ways of identifying, you know, co-identification. You have to do all of those and you have to do it in a real, you have to do it individually and collectively in a really dynamic, dynamical and dynamically self-organizing manner. Um, and it, but the thing that I find encouraging is it sounds like you guys are doing all of what we're talking about right now. Um, it sounds like the con, like it sounds like you're you're, you're training skills and virtues, cultivating character, 
affording new kinds of connections, helping each other, like you're helping each other refine what you care about, what you find relevant, how to zero in. So I think if you're doing the synoptic integration on the way we're talking, and you're also at the same time building your ability to zero in on relevant information, those two things will really support each other very well. Um, no, I think you bring up a really good point about the fact that like, if you look at it, we're almost like multitasking on so many different <laughs> levels. Yeah, yeah. But it happens so naturally that it doesn't feel that way. And like everything still, you know, occurs in a really like deep and meaningful way because it's almost like you're not being tasked with it. Um, it's just something that we all have a natural energy for. So it all naturally like, manifests within our community. I predict that what's going to start happening, or if it, if, it, if it hasn't already, is you'll start noticing at all scales of your life, this ability to zero in on relevant information is improving. I bet you that's going to start happening as long, like, as long as you keep on this course and keep in this community, you're going to start noticing even on like really mundane, trivial areas, you realize you're zeroing in on the relevant information and making more insightful connections. I predict you're going to find that that's going to start disseminating throughout your life much more comprehensively. Because that's, what happens, that's what happens to me. It's already like taking shape in different parts of my life. So no, most definitely. That's cool. That's very cool. Well, I want to thank you both. This has been like a lot of fun for me and like deeply encouraging. Um, I hope, um, I hope you guys uh, have found my, my answers helpful. Um, I'd like to give uh, Gary a chance to uh, say anything because he's been relatively in the background quiet and I appreciate that. He made space for us to have a very free flowing discussion, which I really enjoyed but I'd like to give Gary a chance to uh, interject now. Yeah, I mean, it was just um, just awesome to, to kind of observe and experience and absorb. Um, one, one thought that came to mind about how we are inspired as a community, or um, maybe in particular, I'm inspired uh, by your work and what you've done very, uh, intentionally with the Meaning Crisis series and the, the Dialogo series is um, uh, it seems like you are intentionally trying to embody these transcendent principles that allow for these things that are abstract such as wisdom, commitment to, uh, uh, to, to, to truth, commitment to um, the love like you know Philia Sophia Mm -hmm. um, in this age where it's hard to trust anyone, you thinking out loud, you learning, learning publicly, um, it, it's given me permission to, to do that, right? It's given oh. me permission to wrestle with ideas that are really difficult and also not know, right? Cause, cause you finish a lot of your dialogues with a bunch of open questions, yeah. right? That are like, and, 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 it's, and it's exciting because you can re-explore it at the next time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it gets you, you're, you're excited to wake up in the morning, right? And especially if you have like, I don't know, any, any number, you, you, you have dozens of open threads that are like, you know, Zach Stein, Daniel Schmachtenberger, right? Jordan Hall. Like yeah. um, I was able to chat with Forrest Landry um, the other day, just, just, just one, wonderful people who were like, um, I think you might, I think you were one of the first people that, uh, I exposed in that, in this sort of sense-making space, and uh, it really changed what I what I personally believe was possible mm -hmm. with myself. And so I think about that as someone that is um, partially at the face of this organization, and certainly really present in the internal kind of uh, mm -hmm. workings mm -hmm. of the community of practice. I think about what you are to me. What that like? How can I be to some extent what um, what, um, how can I, how can the, the kids, uh, look up to me, right. And, 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 and be inspired by what I am trying to embody the project that I am trying to mm. uh, further in the same way that I'm inspired by, by people like you. So, um, I guess my question is, uh, are you aware of just, or are, are you really intentional about of being that embodiment of these of all sorts of things and what are your thoughts about that uh, that's um 
Well, thank you for saying that. Um, so I learned from Socrates that you should do what you, like what you said, that you should really try to embody and that most of the, many of these things cannot be taught. I mean, I can use words and gestures, but they're ultimately are going to be taught the way Socrates taught, which is by embody them, embodying them and sharing his process of aspiration and learning as he embodies them with yeah. people who are interested. So that, that means a great deal to me. Um, uh, it's also, I don't want to, how do I, how do I say this? I take very seriously the responsibility of what you've just said, and I don't want to disappoint people. Yeah. Like, um, I, 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 it, we all have, uh, uh, Lord knows we all have enough disappointment. I don't want to, I don't want to draw people in and inspire them and then disappoint them. That would be a, a great failure. Now I'm going to make mistakes. I'm a human being and I do make mistakes and I try to apologize when I do, but we're talking now about my intention and my intention is to as much as possible, um, live out what I have been taught by Socrates and to also not be another source of disappointment for people. I mean, people are, are going to disagree. Both of you ladies probably disagree with parts of what I say here and there, and that's fine. It's expected. But as long as overall you feel that, you know, I, 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 I am neither inflating nor being hypocritical, um, that matters to me. That really matters to me uh, because um, I think the sting of disappointment is, is almost as bad, you know, as the sting of fate. And uh, we need to do whatever we can to, we need to take more seriously um, the fact that when we don't act on principle, we are inevitably going to disappoint human beings and disappoint others. And that is a way of hurting them that, goes very, very deep and is very, very long lasting. And so I don't want to be responsible for that kind of hurt. Yeah. I mean, that's a really appreciate that, that, that thoughtful uh, response. Um, what that reminds me of is, and I think you've talked about this, but I've certainly heard others um, talk about this betrayal. There's almost yeah. nothing worse than feeling betrayed. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like I said, I, we, nobody, nobody should, or can aspire to any ridiculous standards of perfection or anything like that. Uh, but I think a humble and honest aspiration uh, to do the best, to teach the best I can, which means embodying it, not just speaking about it, and to afford people their own aspiration, like Socrates being the midwife, and do the best I possibly can with the help of so many great people uh, to not to not disappoint people that's that matters to me that's beautiful um and if i can add um these two um superheroes that that i brought here today um i like I that see, yeah i mean I, I see them as having kind of infinite potential um and yeah. And, yeah. and just while uh, like they're already extremely inspiring but they're you know, step one is to be committed to these mm -hmm. ideals, right? You're, yeah, you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna, you're gonna fall short. Um, Madison and I like to talk a lot about bullshitting. Self. Yeah, 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 yeah. For self, sure. Self bull and you're gonna bullshit yourself, and you're not gonna know. That's the thing. You're not yeah, gonna know. Yeah, yeah. Unless you're constantly uh, in the process of individual reflective inquiry and group reflective yep. inquiry. Very much. Which Very is, much. Um, and it's. I think what what you've taught all of us is that. Uh, it's hard to think clearly uh, without distrib distributed cognition. Very I mean, much. I believe very deeply in that. Very much. Very you much. Know, and how can you do that without um, listening lovingly? And, and we're not afraid to talk about um, love because it seems to, it's like, it's, a, it's an orientation to the world and others um, that allows you to see what, what's relevant and allow allow you to see what's beautiful in in, in them and um, 
so that they're they're not well, I mean to say the least they're not caricatures right yeah and, yeah yeah and, and so that you you care for them in the way that um, they might care for themselves right and and that's how I feel about you know you know Chabu and Madison right like yeah. I, I I ask them is there anything is there any part of their uh, well-being that doesn't matter to me, right? Is, 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 if, if anything that's happened to them. That's a fantastic question. Yeah. Wow, that's a fantastic question. In, in what way, like, in what way would I, um, the way that I, 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 I choice make uh, is based on the assumption that we are one, I mean, it sounds weird, right? But hang with me here. It's like, I, I, I try to expand my sense of self, right? Yeah. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to include Chabu and Madison, but also as many people as possible, as many, yeah. like, and, and this, is, this, this, is, this is something that, um, this is almost the project of um, you know, empathy, right? Yeah. Applied empathy that al it, it allows you to see more relevant information so you can make choices that don't have as many unintended consequences if you didn't love those people. Yeah, I so. agree. That's very well said. Okay, well, um, I should get going, uh, but I think this was fantastic. I'm gonna upload this uh, to uh, Voices with Raveki. Um, and um, I, I, you know, any links you guys want me put in, yeah. put in, please send them to me. Sounds good. And, and I'll put them in. And I assume that you, uh, Madison and, and Chaba, you guys being here, I have permission to upload you onto my channel. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Great. Okay. So thank you very much. This was, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm getting a little bit choked up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so very much. It was really wonderful. Of course. And uh, sorry, all I have to give are words right now, but my strongest possible encouragement for what you're doing. Um, and I encourage anybody who's watching this, who's interested to reach out uh, to Civics Unplugged because I think, you know, I have this phrase about stealing the culture and I think this is the most beautiful theft of the culture that's happening right now. <laughs> and I really, really appreciate it very, very deeply. So thank you very much, one and all. Take good care, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. All, right. all right, bye. Bye. bye.